This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year in music for 1991, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1991. We also look at the case for putting Barry White into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Museum is the Museum of Broadway in New York City. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1991. In music, the way that music charts were formulated changed in 1991 as Billboard magazine started using the Nielsen SoundScan computer software in order to give a more accurate version of what was selling and to also make it less corruptible. At least until record labels and artists started to game the system by doing things like giving away their albums with the purchase of a cell phone or some other product and letting those sales count. There were still other problems at first. For instance, the Tower Records music chain stores didn't use the same software as everyone else, which skewed numbers until every store chain finally got on the same page. Three people were killed during an audience crush at an ACDC concert. Hollywood's famed record plant studio also closed down in 1991. The first Lollapalooza tour was held that year. And Aerosmith, Janet Jackson, and the Rolling Stones all signed mega-million-dollar record contracts that year. The biggest album of the year was Metallica's Black Album. However, Nirvana's Nevermind and Grunge officially broke through to the mainstream as Pearl Jam also released their album 10 and Soundgarden released Bad Motorfinger. The Seattle Sound, as grunge was originally called, also was the final nail in the coffin of the hair band and hard rock era as going forward bands like Loverboy, Rat, and Cinderella started to lose favor with the public, at least until 80s nostalgia kicked in during the past five, six years or so. Def Leppard released the album Adrenalize, which was the last successful gasp from the hair band era. Guns N' Roses actually landed the first punch to hair bands with their earlier album, Appetite for Destruction, in 1987, but helped to finish off corporate hard rock bands with their 1991 albums, Use Your Illusions 1 and 2. This isn't to say that metal was dead. Nah, not by a long shot. Metal just moved overseas as bands from the Scandinavian countries became popular. Bands like Suffocation and Entombed. Alternative rock also started to take off as R.E.M. released Out of Time, The Smashing Pumpkins released Gish, Toad the Wet Sprocket released Fear, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers released Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Other big albums that year were Natalie Cole's Unforgettable with Love, Michael Jackson's Dangerous, Simply Red's Stars, the KLF's White Room, Dire Straits on Every Street, Ozzy Osbourne's No More Tears, Brian Adams' Waking Up the Neighbors, Prince's Diamonds and Pearls, Michael Bolton's Time, Love, and Tenderness, the soundtrack to the Disney animated movie Beauty and the Beast, and Queen's final album, While Freddie Mercury Was Still Alive, Innuendo. The biggest song that year was the theme song from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Brian Adams' Everything I Do, I Do It For You. Good times. Whitney Houston sang one of the most memorable versions of the Star Spangled Banner at the Super Bowl that year. Her version was released as a single and became a huge hit as people were caught up in the patriotic fever since the Gulf War had just started a week or so earlier than the Super Bowl. That's the original Gulf War, not Gulf War II electric boogaloo that George W. Bush had in Iraq. Other hit songs of 1991 included I Want to Sex You Up from Color Me Bad, CNC Music Factory's Gonna Make You Sweat, Everybody Dance Now, Paula Abdul's Rush Rush, One More Try from Timmy T, Unbelievable from EMF, 
Extreme with more than words, high fives I like the way, the first time from Surface, and Baby Baby from Amy Grant. Janet Jackson became the first artist to have seven songs from the same album, in this case Rhythm Nation, to make it onto the top five of the Billboard singles chart. Garth Brooks became a megastar with the album Rope in the Wind, helping to move pop country to the forefront for pretty much the entire 1990s. Other big albums included Don't Rock the Jukebox by Alan Jackson, It's About to Change by Travis Tritt, For My Broken Heart by Reba McIntyre, Pocket Full of Gold by Vince Gill, Don't Go Near the Water from Sammy Kershaw, Heroes from Paul Overstreet, Brand New Man from Brooks and Dunn, Aces from Susie Boggess, and What Do I Do With Me from Tanya Tucker. On the country singles chart, Garth Brooks had four number one songs with Unanswered Prayers, The Thunder Rolls, Shameless, and Two of a Kind Working on a Full House. George Strait had three number one songs with You Know Me Better Than That, If I Know Me, and I've Come to Expect It From You. And Brooks and Dunn had two number one songs with Brand New Man and My Next Broken Heart. Alternative rap took hold, beginning with Tribe Called Quest's Low End Theory and continuing with classic rap albums from Gangstar and De La Soul. 80s hip-hop superstars Public Enemy came out with their last big album, Apocalypse 91, The Enemy Strikes Black. MC Light, Queen Latifah, and Naughty by Nature also released hit albums in 1991. Big songs from the year included The Ghetto Boys' Minds Playing Tricks on Me. A Tribe Called Quest Check the Rhyme and Scenario with Leaders of the New School. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince's Summertime. Naughty by Nature's OPP. Ice T's Original Gangster. Black Sheep's The Choice is Yours. Cypress Hill's How I Could Just Kill a Man. Main Source's Live at the Barbecue and De La Soul's Millie Pulled a Pistol on Santa. In dance music, DJ Magazine, which was a reboot of the magazine Jocks, started publication in 1991. Trip Hop made its debut of sorts when Massive Attack released their album Blue Lines. The Prodigy also released their first single, Charlie. Legendary DJ Carl Cox burst onto the dance scene for the first time with the song I Want You. The city of Frankfurt, Germany, became the capital of trance music for a time, as producers like Resistance D brought their spin to a dance genre that was beginning to find its way to a wider audience by then. Eurodance held its own with hit songs from artists like Black Box, Crystal Waters, Enigma, London Beat, Latour, The KLF, Karina, and Stereo MCs. It would be about another 20 years or so before electronic dance music completely exploded and became the dominant genre of the 2010s. However, pop dance, as it was known back then, did very well in 1991 with dance hits by D-Light, Madonna, Mariah Carey, Kathy Dennis, PM Dawn, CNC Music Factory, Prince, and Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. Even U2 got into the electronica era with their EDM-infused album Octung Baby. Christian contemporary music broke through in 1991 as artists Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant both had hit albums. Luis Miguel brought Boleros back to the mainstream in the 1990s with his album Romance. Other Latin music artists who were big in 1991 included Ana Gabriel, Miriam Hernand, Juan Gabriel, Cheyenne, Daniela Romo, Bronco, Maz, Selena y los Dinos, and Luis Enrique. Musicals or revivals of musicals that were around in 1991 included The Will Rogers Follies, Forbidden Broadway, Volume 2, Phantom, The Secret Garden, and Children of Eden. Musical movies and documentaries that were released included For the Boys, The Five Heartbeats, Stepping Out, The Commitments, The Animated Movies, and American Tale Five Goes West, Rockadoodle, Rover Dangerfield, The Magic Riddle, and Beauty and the Beast, along with Madonna's tour documentary Truth or Dare. Bands that formed in 1991 included Two Unlimited, Ab Logic, Black Street, Belly, Bone Thugs and Harmony, Counting Crows, Chemical Brothers, Cake, House of Pain, 
Luscious Jackson, The Muffs, Oasis, Painkiller, Pete Rock and CL Smooth, Power Man 5000, Primitive Radio Gods, Rage Against the Machine, Utah Saints, and The Three Six Mafia. Bands that broke up, of course, before their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus in 1991 included the two live crew, Alias, Animal Logic, Bad English, Big Pig, Edie Brickell and the New Bohemians, Devo, Dio, NWA, YNT, Modern English, The Traveling Woolburys, Transvision Vamp, Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam, Talk Talk, Talking Heads, Throwing Muses, Stetisonic, Bruce Hornsby and the Range, and the Fat Boys. The Knack and Procol Harum actually reformed in 1991. Artists who were born in 1991 include Ed Sheeran, Carol G., Louis Tomlinson of One Direction, Charlie Puth, Jesse Nelson, and Leanne Pinnock, both of Little Mix, Anne Marie, along with rappers DaBaby, Offset, Quavo, Young Thug, NF, Fetty Wap, Moneybag Yo, PNB Rock, and Tyler the Creator. November 24th of 1991 was the date that Freddie Mercury of Queen passed away from complications from AIDS, and Eric Carr of Kiss also passed away that day from cancer. Legendary festival promoter Bill Graham was killed in a helicopter crash. Also passing away in 1991 was Eric Clapton's son, Connor, who fell out of a window in New York City. His passing became the subject of Clapton's hit single, Tears in Heaven. Seven members of Reba McIntyre's touring band passed away in a plane crash that year. Other musical artists who passed away included Steve Clark from Def Leppard, jazz trumpet player Buck Clayton, composer Ernst Krennic, singer and actor Yves Montand, singer Mort Schumann, musician Andres Panufnik, singer Tennessee Ernie Ford, musician Ole Biech, singer Roy Black, jazz great Miles Davis, singer Dottie West, Violinist Zeno Franciscati, jazz saxophonist Charlie Barnett, pianist Claudio Aurora, jazz saxophonist Stan Getz, Temptation singer David Ruffin, singer Gene Clark, Egyptian singer Mohammed Abdel Wahab, composer Carmine Coppola, guitarist Johnny Thunders, musician Steve Marriott, composer Doc Palmas, guitar maker Leo Fender, French singer Serge Gainsbourg, lyricist Howard Ashman, and singer and actor Renato Rascal. In award ceremonies for the music of 1991, at the Grammy Awards, Natalie Cole won three of the four major awards, including Album of the Year for Unforgettable with Love and Song and Record of the Year for her digitalized duet with her father, Nat King Cole, simply called Unforgettable. Mark Cohen, whose big hit that year was Walking in Memphis, won Best New Artist. At the American Music Awards, the big winners were Color Me Bad, CNC Music Factory, Michael Bolton, Paula Abdul, Luther Vandross, Garth Brooks, Reba McIntyre, and Brian Adams. At the Billboard Music Awards, Mariah Carey was Artist of the Year. At the MTV Video Music Awards, R.E.M. won Video of the Year for the song Losing My Religion. Luther Vandross won Album of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards, and Garth Brooks and Reba McIntyre won the music categories at the People's Choice Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held in Rome, Italy that year, Carola from Sweden won for the song Fangad av en Stormwind. Garth Brooks won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and he also won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Seal won Best British Album for his self-titled debut album, and Queen won Best Song for These Are the Days of Our Lives at the Brit Awards. Brian Adams won Entertainer of the Year at the Juno Awards. Baby Animals won Album of the Year for their self-titled album, and Yothu Yindi won Song of the Year for Treaty, the Filthy Lucre remix, at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, the Will Rogers Follies won Best Musical, and Fiddler on the Roof won Best Revival of a Musical. 
At the Academy Awards for the music of 1991, the movie Beauty and the Beast won Best Score for Alan Menken and also Best Song for its self-titled theme song. The Pulitzer Prize was shared between Shulamit Ran for Symphony, Bright Shang for Four Movements for Piano, and Charles Fussell for Wild. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on January 16th at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. The mood of the ceremony was overshadowed by the start of the Gulf War that year, which started while the ceremony was going on that night with an attack on the city of Baghdad in Iraq. In fact, during that night's attack, CNN, then only known as a fledgling cable news network that some people kind of knew about, were one of the first and few news outlets who were broadcasting the attack live from a Baghdad rooftop. It turned CNN into must-watch television that year. Even people at the ceremony were trying to find televisions to watch. That night was the unofficial night that the 24-7 news cycle became a thing as people were glued to their TV sets as the war unfolded, making CNN famous. During the ceremony, the hall inducted record executive Nasui Erdogan into the non-performers category. Band leader Dave Bartholomew and record producer Ralph Bass were inducted into the non-performers category. Howlin' Wolf was inducted into the early influencers category. And in the performers category, the hall inducted John Lee Hooker, Laverne Baker, The Impressions, Jimmy Reed, Ike and Tina Turner, Wilson Pickett, and this next group. The group The Birds were formed in 1964 in Los Angeles, California. The original group lineup was Roger McGuinn, David Crosby, Gene Clark, Michael Clark, and Chris Hillman. McGuinn, Crosby, and Gene Clark all came up doing the folk music coffee shop circuit back in the day. And while the three of them loved folk music, they were, like everybody else at the time, influenced by the rock music that was coming out of England. The three of them recruited Hillman and Michael Clark to complete their group. After starting out playing rock music, the Birds wanted to combine folk music with rock music and to also bring in vocal harmonies. And while Bob Dylan was considered the king of folk music at that time, the Birds actually were the ones who brought folk music to the mainstream by combining them with the vocal harmonies, along with McGuinn's signature Rickenbacker 360 12 string guitar, and the Birds became one of the most influential groups of the 1960s. In 1964, the group was signed to Columbia Records. In January 1965, they entered Columbia Recording Studios in Hollywood, California to start work on their debut album. On June 21st, 1965, they released their debut album, Mr. Tambourine Man, which included, of course, a cover of Bob Dylan's song of the exact same name. When they recorded the song Mr. Tambourine Man in late January 1965, their producer, Terry Melcher, didn't think that the group worked well as musicians together yet. So Terry kept Roger McGuinn's guitar playing and brought in the Hall of Fame session musicians known as the Wrecking Crew to play on the songs Mr. Tambourine Man and the track's B-side, I Knew I'd Want You, making McGuinn the only bird member to play an instrument on both of those tracks. Ironically, it was their version of Dylan's Mr. Tambourine Man that was the bellwether song to the folk rock mainstream revolution. Dylan's original version was released as part of his Bringing It All Home album in March of 1965. One month later, on April 12th, with Dylan's blessing no less, the Birds released their cover version of the song with McGuinn doing lead vocal duties on that. The Birds version became a big hit, hitting number one in America, Great Britain, South Africa, and Ireland. The Birds version is now considered not just the start of folk rock's popularity in the mainstream, but also one of the greatest singles of all time, and the album Mr. Tambourine Man is considered one of the biggest moments in pop music history. 
Their second album, Turn, 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 was recorded between June and November of 1965 and released on December 6, 1965. The album continued their innovative folk rock style and went to number 17 on the album's chart in America. The song Turn, Turn, Turn also became a huge hit, going to number one in America. Their third album, Fifth Dimension, was recorded from January to May of 1966 and was released on July 18th of 1966. It took the group in a new direction, moving them into psychedelic rock, especially with their 1966 song, Eight Miles High. By 1967, the usual band tensions started to rear their ugly heads. Gene Clark left the group due to anxiety issues, along with a really bad case of stage fright. After their fourth album, 1967's Younger Than Yesterday, both Michael Clark and David Crosby wore out their welcome with Roger McGuinn, and both of them were bounced out of the Birds in 1967. After two more albums, the Birds helped to pioneer country rock with their 1968 album, Sweethearts of the Rodeo, with songs like You Ain't Going Nowhere. Graham Parsons had joined the group by that point and was influential with the recording of this album, which was recorded in Nashville and Hollywood between March and May of 1968, as Graham Parsons was very much into country music at that time and brought it into the making of this album. When the album was released on August 30th, 1968, the reviews were mixed at best, as some critics didn't actually like the blending of country and rock music. It also didn't do well on the charts, only getting as high as number 77 in America and not even charting overseas. However, it is credited as not only pioneering country rock, but also influencing a lot of future groups like, of course, the Eagles. Right around the release of Sweethearts of the Rodeo, Graham Parsons left the Birds due to his opposition to the apartheid regime of South Africa, where the Birds were actually slated to play. He decided not to play in accordance with his opposition. According to some people, though, Graham used it as an excuse to quit the band so that he could hang out more with Keith Richards and the Rolling Stones, who he had become big friends with. Chris Hillman left the Birds as well, not for a principled reason or to hang out with Keith Richards, mind you. The group continued on with McGuinn helming a new version of the Birds until 1972, releasing five more albums. The original members then came back in 1972-1973 to record what became their final album, Birds, which was released on March 7, 1973. And then the group officially broke up. McGuinn got together with Gene Clark and Chris Hillman from 1977 to 1981. Then Clark got together a new version of the group between 1989 to 1991, but was sued by the original members of the group who wanted to do a reunion tour of their own by the name The Birds. When The Birds were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1991, the original five members showed up to accept and to also perform. It would be their last performance together as the full original lineup of the group. The main thread during the group's 1964 to 1973 run was Roger McGuinn, who was there throughout all of the versions of the 1964 to 73 groups. Gene Clark, who actually won the right to use the bird's name in that lawsuit from earlier, was there on and off from 1964 to 1967 and from, of course, 1972 to 1973 when they all got back together. But he passed away from heart issues only a few months after their Hall of Fame performance in 1991. Michael Clark was there on and off from 1964 to 1967 and, of course, between 72 and 73 as well, but he passed away from liver issues in 1993. David Crosby was there on and off as well from 64 to 67 and again from 72 to 73, but he just recently passed away in 2023 from COVID-19 complications. 
When Crosby left the group, he became part of Crosby, Stills, and Nash, who were themselves inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1997, and then they added Neil Young to that group to become CSNY, or Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. And with three of the original members passing away by now, this leaves McGuinn and Hillman at least as of this recording, as the only original members who are still alive. Out of the group's replacement members during their 1964-73 to creative period, Graham Parsons, Kevin Kelly, Clarence White, and Skip Batten have all passed away. Kevin Kelly was there in 1968 and passed away from natural causes in 2002. Clarence White was there from 1968 to 73 and was struck and killed by a drunk driver in 1973. Skip Batten was there from 1970 to 1973 and passed away in 2003 from Alzheimer's disease. Graham Parsons was there for a hot minute in 1968 for the Sweethearts album and then quit. He passed away in 1973 from a drug and alcohol overdose then had his body famously kidnapped out to Joshua Tree National Forest in California by his road manager and his assistant at the time, and set on fire in a Viking funeral. What was left of his body was eventually buried in New Orleans. The entire theft of the body has its own story and is worthy of its own podcast someday, but if you want to watch a movie about the whole thing, then check out 2003's movie Grand Theft Parsons, which starred Johnny Knoxville, Christina Applegate, Robert Forster, and Michael Shannon. Gene Parsons, who was there from 1968 to 1972, and John York, who was there from 1968 to 1969, are, as of this recording, still alive. The Birds put out 12 albums, 3 live albums, 6 EPs, and 47 compilation albums. Of those, 9 of their albums went top 40 in America, with their 1967 Greatest Hits album hitting number 6. They also released 29 singles. Of those, 7 went top 40, with 1965's Turn, Turn, Turn and Mr. Tambourine Man both hitting number 1. They were nominated for 7 Grammy Awards, winning 3 of them, including Best New Artist in 1965. Their harmonic style, along with their sound, are still part of music today, influencing everyone from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, R.E.M., The Eagles, and The Smiths. Inducted by Don Henley of 1998 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees, The Eagles, Chris Hillman, David Crosby, Gene Clark, Michael Clark, and Roger McGuinn, The Birds, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1991, and we have put a selection of their music onto this week's podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Here's something that's going to completely shock you. Barry White is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I know, right? The Maestro of Love is not in a hall that already has soul singers like Otis Redding, Marvin Gaye, the Reverend Al Green, etc., etc. The man pretty much responsible for at least a quarter of the entire world's population because a lot of people were having sex to his music? The dude's voice could make the word gingivitis sound sexy. Don't believe me? It actually happened. David Letterman's top 10 list once had top 10 words that sound romantic when spoken by Barry White. It's on YouTube if you want to check it out, but damned if he didn't make even the word gingivitis sound like it was sexy time. Now, 
I can't believe that the Hall has put me in a position where I have to make the case for Barry White to be inducted, but it's not a perfect world, so here we are. So, to the tale of the tape we go. In his lifetime, Barry White released 20 studio albums and 13 compilation albums. Of those, eight went top 40 on the United States pop chart, with two of those eight going top 10, including 1974's Can't Get Enough going to number one. On the American R&B charts, it was seven number ones for Barry, including his first four albums going number one. Barry also released 60 singles. Of those, 11 hit the top 40 pop charts, with six of those 11 going top 10, including 1974's Can't Get Enough of Your Love going to number one. On the U.S. R&B charts, 27 hit the top 40, with 14 of those 27 hitting the top 10, including six hitting number one. Worldwide, Barry had 20 gold and 10 platinum singles, plus 106 gold albums, with 41 of those going platinum. Barry sold over 100 million records, making him one of the biggest selling artists of all time, regardless of genre. He also influenced at least two generations of R&B singers, along with helping to bring the orchestral sound to R&B with his Love Unlimited orchestra. His deep, smooth voice helped to birth an awful lot of babies with songs like It's Ecstasy When You Lay Down Next to Me, What Am I Gonna Do With You, You're the First, The Last, My Everything, Never Never Gonna Give You Up, and I'm Gonna Love You Just a Little More, Baby. His famous catchphrases, Show You Right, and Take Off That Brazier, My Dear, became household phrases. Plus, like I've already said countless times by now, the dude's music helped to create a quarter of the world's population, more than likely. I'm sure someone's done a study on that one. You can't get much more rock and roll than that. Put Barry White in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame already, please. He is long overdue. And to prove it, we have put his music onto this week's podcast music playlist, the link to which, as always, is in the show notes. There is a museum in the heart of Times Square in New York City that's dedicated to the history of Broadway shows that you may not be aware of. The Museum of Broadway is at 145 West 45th Street between 6th Avenue and 7th Avenue. The museum was supposed to open up in 2021, but the pandemic put that dream to bed for about a year. The museum is open seven days a week at 9.30 a.m., but their closing hours shift depending on the day, especially Wednesdays when it closes around 2.30 during the colder months. The museumofbroadway.com is their website, and we will put that website into the show notes for you. Now that COVID lockdowns are done and it's been a year or two that Broadway has been up and running, Broadway is now back at the top of its game with shows that I like to call tourist trap musicals. You know, those are the ones that tourists come to New York City specifically to see. And if you live in New York City, you're forced to take your out of town visitors to go see them, whether you want to go see them or not. I'm talking about any of the songbook musicals from acts like ABBA, Carol King, or anything from Andrew Lloyd Webber, or God forbid, anything from Disney. Of course, there's always the great Hamilton, but good luck getting those tickets. About once every decade or so, at least one musical transcends Broadway and becomes a pop culture phenomenon. Think Hamilton in the past decade, or The Producers almost 20 years ago by now. There was, at one time, another great period on Broadway with a musical that also became a pop culture icon. The 1960s were considered one of the blockbuster periods for Broadway musicals. There were ten shows that had over a thousand performances and three that had over two thousand performances. One of those shows' cast albums was so popular that it made Billboard magazine's list of greatest chart-performing albums of all time. 
This musical is also an example of how failing the first time out does not mean the end of the world. The musical Hello, Dolly! was written by Jerry Herman and Michael Stewart. In 1835, there was a play called A Day Well Spent. In 1938, Thornton Wilder took the plot from that play and turned it into his own play called The Merchant of Yonkers. That play, by the way, tanked really badly. Not one to give up on an idea, though. Wilder revised the play, and 17 years later, he brought it back again as the play The Matchmaker. This time, it became a hit and was turned into the 1958 film The Matchmaker, starring Shirley Booth, Anthony Hopkins, and Shirley MacLaine. When it came time to do the musical version of the story, even that had problems. The role of Dolly was originally written with Ethel Merman in mind, but she turned it down. So did actress Mary Martin, who became famous for playing Peter Pan on Broadway. Carol Channing ended up playing the role and became a star because of it. By the way, uh, Merman and Martin would end up playing Dolly later on during its Broadway run once Carol Channing left the show. And, of course, Merman and Martin agreed to come and do the show once they realized that it was a huge hit. Because, sure, why not? Even making Gower champion as director on this came after a lot of the other top musical directors turned it down first, which must have made him feel really special. Not. Anyway, the musical started its run in Detroit, Michigan, and Washington, D.C., where reviewers trashed it. The musical then had major changes made to it. They added a couple of songs and changed the title of the musical from Dolly, a Damned Exasperating Woman, to Hello, Dolly. That name change happened after someone heard Louis Armstrong's version of the song Hello, Dolly, which was getting popular at that time. Finally, the musical Hello, Dolly premiered on Broadway in 1964 to rave reviews. It held the record for the longest run on Broadway for a few years, and it won 10 Tony Awards, which tied it with South Pacific for the most Tony Awards ever until the producers in Hamilton broke that record. The original cast recording became a huge hit on the Billboard Albums chart, reaching number one, a title it held for seven weeks until it got knocked off by another album called Hello, Dolly!, Louis Armstrong's album with the song that inspired the musical to change its name in the first place. How's that for irony? It was also the biggest selling album of 1964, even bigger than anything those four guys from Liverpool put out in America that year. The cast recording also took home a Grammy Award, and the 1969 movie version of the musical also became a huge hit and won three Academy Awards. The Broadway musical Hello, Dolly! with various props and wardrobe in the collection of the Museum of Broadway in New York City, and we will put the music for that cast album onto this week's music podcast playlist. The link, as I've said before, is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.